the shepherds had known that they needed to be awake and prepared for what would meet them that night, we'll be looking at the shepherds and Mary and Joseph as we we'll take a brief look at uh, where the world was as we come to the Gospel of Luke. We're in the second chapter, are verses 1 through 20 from Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went out from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Isaiah passage always comes on this night, and it's not just because it's Christmas Eve and we meet in the evening. Uh, it comes because this is the state of the world. The people walking in darkness suddenly saw a great light. Those living in a land of deep darkness, even in the valley of the shadow of death, on them light dawned. For the people of God, at least the people of God 2,000 years ago, it might have felt very dark indeed. Things did not well, seem to be going the way that they ought to for the chosen ones of God living in the promised land. 2,000 plus years ago in Palestine, in Judea, the places where Mary and Joseph are traveling around, there was a foreign army and a foreign nation which has occupied the land. And in the land where God said there shall be no graven images, the Roman uh, soldiers and their officials were worshiping false gods and even the false king Herod, uh, maybe not a false king but set up by the Romans, uh, put up with by the Romans perhaps, was not afraid to make statues and other graven images. The people of God seemed to be walking in a very dark time. More than that, it seemed as if God may have forgotten them. They had not heard the words of a prophet. God's word to God's people coming from the authoritative mouth of a prophet, both bringing rebuke as well as encouragement and comfort for hundreds of years. 700 years before Jesus was born was when Isaiah was talking about the people walking in darkness, but he talked about that land up in Galilee in the north. The people there would see a light shine, and that is where Mary and Joseph left in order to come to Bethlehem. 400 years since any prophet had written something down that the people acknowledged as the word of God, which must be written and kept and regarded as scripture. It's been hundreds of years. Where has God gone? Has God forgotten? Has God forsaken us? Has God turned his face away? Have we been abandoned by God? The people are still going through the motions of life, dealing with this uh, foreign occupier, worshipping at the temple, trying to do things the way that they ought. But in many ways, and in many cases, God seemed far off. And that was the case for God's people then. It has been the case in different times for God's people over the centuries and millennia since. And for individual people of God, sons and daughters of the Most High God. There have been times where we've wondered, is God still at work? Is God interested? Is God still caring? Is God still loving? Is God still good? Is God going to do anything in this world, particularly about the mess in which we find ourselves? God's people wondered, is God with us and is God for us and is God with me? And they were walking in darkness. Mary also 
And we kind of take for granted a bit, I'm afraid, uh, what Mary's going through here. She is a very young woman, not yet a bride, expecting a baby any day now. But because of these Romans and their rules and Caesar Augustus over in Rome saying that everybody must be enrolled and register so he can figure out how many people he's ruling over and how much money he may make from them. Now Mary and Joseph's lives have been caught up in this mess, uh, this turn of world history about which they cared not at all. Mary and Joseph, one has to wonder, are they even getting along very well at this point? Because you see, Mary is with child and they're not yet married. And Joseph has some legitimate questions about this, some of which were answered in a dream. An angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Do not be afraid, Joseph, to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. That may not have been comforting news to Joseph at the time. She's with child, conceived by the Holy Spirit. What does this all mean? But they have made their way a hundred miles or more from Nazareth in the north to Judea and finally to Bethlehem in the south. And there, they're looking for a place to stay so they can uh, follow up on this registration. But now they need a place for Mary to have a baby and there is no good place for her. Mary is young and engaged and far from home, and she has left her family behind. Her family didn't come with her to Bethlehem. And the folks that they find in Bethlehem are relatives of Joseph's, but not necessarily his close family either. She's doubly burdened here. Not only do they need desperately to find a place where she can have this child, and who is going to take care of her through it all, but she's got this strange knowledge, this strange revelation, that the child within her is a holy one. The holy one to be born will be called the Son of God. Gabriel, the angel who told her this, was relatively clear about it, but it does not mean that it made suddenly her life uh, feel like it was full of light. Instead, uh, a heavy burden is she, she is carrying as she comes to Bethlehem, this place she has probably never been to before, where she knows no one. And there's no place for them to stay, at least not a proper place for her to have this child. There was indeed no crib for his bed, but there will be a manger. Well, into Mary and Joseph's darkness, trying to deal with the necessities of life and deal with the burdens of uh, this foreign nation being in the promised land and dealing with this knowledge that something extraordinary is going on in their relationship and with this child yet to be born, they don't know what it all means. But in a dark and strange place far from home, a child is born. Just as the angel said. And it is a son, just as the angel said. And they know that they will name him Jesus, because that's what Gabriel had told them they would name him. He will save Jesus or Joshua. And that's relatively glorious, uh, certainly. Um, There's a certain aspect of this child coming to the world that is glorious, but there's a lot of it that is strange and dark and frightening and lonely and exhausting. And maybe they're more relieved than feeling glorious that this child has come safely into the world. Little do they know how much glory is present at that moment. But then, while this is going on in Mary Joseph's life, of course, the shepherds are going about their duties as they normally would. They're out in the fields, right where they ought to be. They're watching over their flocks, meaning most of them are asleep. And they're all hoping most of the sheep are asleep. At least one person has been posted to keep watch, not expecting anything to happen. It's a night like any other. Hopefully the sheep will be quiet. Maybe there will be no predators. The sheep won't get nervous and wake up and start making us have to work. Maybe we can get a little bit of sleep tonight. And if nothing happens, maybe I can catch a few wings while everybody else is sleeping and they will be none the wiser when I wake the next person for their watch out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And suddenly everything changed. Now they weren't feeling like they were themselves, the people walking in darkness. The shepherds weren't feeling particularly favored by God or by the people. They didn't have a particularly good reputation. They didn't smell very good. They weren't ceremonially clean. They weren't really very clean, period. They were known to tell tall tales, which was a problem, I think, when they came out from Bethlehem after they ventured into it. But eventually people did pay attention to what they said. 
of an ordinary night, in the middle of ordinary darkness, on a hillside outside Bethlehem, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And it was not the full glory of God, because the full glory of God would have uh, put to death every sheep and shepherd on uh, the hillside there, but enough that they could tell that God has shown up, and this is not necessarily good news. With all the people wondering, has God forgotten us? Has God forsaken us? No, God has decided to show up this night, and he are is an angel, the messenger of God and the representative of God, and one shining with the glory of God. And God has shown up, and they are not relieved, uh, they are not rejoicing, they are not saying, finally God has appeared, they are scared to death. They cannot speak, they cannot catch their breath, not very many of them are probably still on their feet, they are in big trouble here because suddenly an angel is here, which is as good as saying that God has appeared on this hillside. So the angel says, of course, do not be afraid, which never works. If somebody's terrified, you tell them, oh, don't be afraid. It's not an instant thing that they can switch on and off. They are still scared to death, but at least they are able to take in some of what the angel says. Why should we not be afraid? This is terrifying. It was night a minute ago, and suddenly this great floodlight of the glory of God is shining around them, and everything is strange, and everything is terrifying. And the angel says, don't be afraid, because I'm bringing you good news of great joy. What I have to tell you is going to be the source of rejoicing. And it is news for you, and it will be joy for you, and it will be joy for all the people. All the people will rejoice in this news. And here's what it is. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. And he is Christ, the Messiah, the Promised One. The Lord, the one the people of God have been waiting for for hundreds of years. 400 years before was the last time they heard that there would one day come a time when God would show up and make everything different and everything, uh, the end of time would come and all that is threatening God's people would be taken away and God's people would finally be vindicated. This is good news. Good news of great joy. This will be a sign, so you know that I'm telling you the truth. You'll find the day wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Well, that is a strange thing to say. We don't, we don't put babies in mangers now or then. And so that would be the way that they would know. They've begun to catch their breath. They're trying to think what it is that this angel has just said. Something about a savior. Wait, the Messiah is finally here. God has come on earth. What are we to do? And then, before they can get their wits, before they can catch their breath, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host, a multitude of angels, and these are not sweet singing angels, although I think they do sing in their praising of God. This is the army of God, the army of heaven come down to earth in all of its might, more angels than you could count are suddenly there and it is blindingly light and it is even more scary than before and all these angels are praising God. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Glory to God and peace and God's favor. And these shepherds suddenly realize that they who are on the outskirts of society, they who are uh, talked badly about by most people in town, they are ones on whom God's favor rests because they have seen the mighty host of heaven and they have lived. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said, as if it was natural to carry on a conversation after this, surely some things happen in the meantime. The angels go, they cannot see because they've been blinded by the light of heaven, and then they can't decide what exactly it is that they have seen or heard, and they get their story together, and they all realize, wait, he said the same thing. We all understood it in Bethlehem. Right now, the Messiah has been born. Let's go there. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord... Because when an angel speaks, he's giving God's word. And when, when the angel speaks, it's as if the Lord is speaking. The Lord has told us about this. Let's go find out. If you were somebody on the scene, you wouldn't have wanted to be on the scene, actually. It would have been pretty terrifying. Suddenly see all these angels show up. You saw the one, and there was a light, and you go to investigate the light, and then suddenly you're surrounded by angels. It's a terrifying scenario to be in. But if you were an outside spectator uh, taking notes on this, you would have thought that when all these angels show up, so many that you cannot count them, when the host of heaven appears on earth, that would have been the most glorious thing that happened that whole night. And you would almost be right. 
But you see, the most glorious thing that happened that night is God took on flesh and dwelt among us. The Word of God, with God from the beginning, who was God, all things were created through Him and by Him and for Him, is now lying in a manger. The eternal Son of God, about whom John says, we saw Him, and in Him we saw God's glory. Full of the glory of God in its fullness in that strange dark place where Mary has just brought forth a child, all the glory of God is present there. The most glorious thing happening that night was God come to earth, Emmanuel, God with us. Mary and Joseph are still trying to deal with the effect of the prophecies and predictions that they've been given in dreams and by angels, and they're trying to come to grips with the fact that they are brand new parents, and nobody has told them how to do this. There is no instruction manual. And here they are uh, in this strange place, and the baby's in the manger, and they're just starting to recover, and suddenly strangers burst in, and that is probably not what you hope for when you have just given birth to your firstborn child. You are not expecting people you do not know, unless they are medical professionals, to come storming into the room, but that's what happened to Mary and Joseph. When we had Sophie, we were still finishing our time at seminary and working at the seminary and about to move. In fact, we were waiting to move until Sophie was old enough to make the trip. Five and a half weeks. I don't recommend that. You should wait a little bit longer. But then we moved to North Carolina and five years later we were expecting another child and now we're in a bit of trouble because we don't know exactly how this church is going to respond to a new baby being born to the pastor and his wife and what if people show up when we're not expecting them. Who is going to come down? Now, we did pick a hospital that was about 40 minutes away. That was slightly helpful. But we had to strategize. We even had to strategize about who was going to be in the room when the baby was born because though Sophie, uh, when she was born, it was just the two of us and the people helping, of course. For the second child, there was great discussion about whether there would be any grandmothers to be present in the room. One of whom, my wife's mother. The other of whom, my mother, a certified Lamaze coach present at dozens, possibly hundreds of births, would love to be there for the birth of her second grandchild on our side of the family. With the first child, they waited until Sophie was born and flew up to Boston to be with her. This child, they decided, well, you know, we have a little time. So they came early to North Carolina, and they waited. And they were in Roanoke Rapids for days, and they were waiting, just thinking maybe this child would be born, and Wendy's not going into labor, and my mom's still there. So finally on Friday, they have to travel home. They go home Friday. Wendy's parents come on Saturday. Saturday night, we're on our way to the hospital. We have many defenses since then. Wendy and my mom get along just great. But I am sure there was some discussion about why exactly it was that she could not have had the baby the day before, but now had to wait till Saturday. And so we know my mom's not going to be in the room, and we know that Wendy's mom's going to be at home taking care of our other child. But once this baby's born, what are we going to do? Can we hide it? We can't hide it. Because I told you it was a Saturday night when Wendy went into labor. I had a standing commitment on Sunday mornings. There is something I'm supposed to be doing on Sunday mornings. And suddenly at 10 o'clock I realized, I'm not preaching tomorrow. And I have to call my elder, who has been waiting for this call, not knowing when it's going to come, and praying that it would be on a Monday or Tuesday. So on Saturday night I call my friend Wally and say, you're up. You're going to have to lead worship tomorrow at two churches. And I'm so sorry. And I hope you've been working on a sermon. But I'm going to the hospital now. So now we know... Hours after this child is born, people are going to go to church, and I'm not going to be there, and they're going to know that Wendy has gone into labor, and maybe this child has been born. So who's going to show up in our room? God was very gracious. Nobody showed up unexpectedly. Uh, we were able to be protected in our time in the hospital. Mary, 12 or 13, maybe 14, not so fortunate. Shepherds come by. That's not really... Uh, the most appropriate way to start uh, this child's life. You don't want to have that story that, oh, well, the first people to come visit, of course, were the shepherds. People don't associate with those shepherds. They're not supposed to be there. Mary had been visited by an angel who said, you will give birth to a child, and he will be the Holy One, the Son of God. And Joseph was told in the dream, do not be afraid to take Mary, for this one who is conceived within her is of the Holy Spirit. And finally, added to that witness and testimony, when this child is born, shepherds and angels declare, this is the one we've been waiting for. 
One of the things that strikes me most about this passage is the shepherds come, they tell them what they'd heard from the angels, and sure enough, here's this child wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Who would have thought that? But it's just like the angels said. And then they go, and they can't keep their mouths shut. They tell everybody they see what they had found out and what they had experienced that night. They return glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. They saw a baby who hadn't done anything yet, but whom the angel had told them would be the Son of God, the Messiah, the Promised One, the One who would make all things right, the One who was God's presence on earth doing great things, and not having seen what He's going to do, not having waited around to see if He's going to be a precocious child and do anything spectacular as an infant, they go their way because they heard good news, and that was enough. Their darkness had been lit up by the glory of God. They heard good news of a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The shepherds go, they see, and then they go their way glorifying and praising God. This is what I want for us this night. No matter what gloom or darkness or even valley of the shadow of death we have been traveling recently. Without going through the whole story, although we can't begin with the incarnation and not go through his life and his death and his resurrection and ascension. But I want us, with those shepherds and with Mary and Joseph, to hear good news. Good news. For to you and to me was born this day in the city of David a Savior, Christ the Lord. One who was born, who lived for you and died for you and was raised again from the dead for you. That you might have a Savior, a God who has not forgotten, a God who will not abandon you or forsaken you, a God who promises to be with you always, a Savior. News of great joy. Will you please join me in prayer? Oh Lord, our God, we pray that we would also hear good news with the shepherds and Mary and Joseph and all those who heard the words of the shepherd, that we would be amazed once again, that we would be in awe and wonder that such a great God would come near, Emmanuel, God with us, would come to us to save us from all that threatens us, body and soul, as Savior is Christ the Lord. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.